Hi, I'm Jason Mears and I'm going to take you through the building blocks of virtualization and cloud. And just to be absolutely clear, the presentation you're about to see is entirely my own work and is 100% unofficial and unauthorized. Just to clarify what I mean by that is that this presentation contains several images of various brands of building blocks and VMware products and services. However, this presentation is not approved, not endorsed, and not made in association or collaboration with VMware Inc. or Lego AS. This presentation is provided for educational purposes only. Furthermore, I must state that Lego AS is not affiliated with VMware Inc. and the illustrations in this presentation should not be interpreted as an endorsement of VMware products or services. So to begin, uh, we're going to talk first of all about physical servers and relating uh, server hardware and physical hardware to building blocks and then the challenges with physical servers, how we then improve that with virtualization and then how we move on to creating a virtualization platform from data centers and clouds. So we're going to start with physical servers. So if we take this concept that we're going to describe all the hardware in a server as building blocks and what we're going to do is we're going to use the same colors or colors depending on whether you're UK or US through this section for consistency and in this example again 100% unofficial example we're going to use a green building block to represent a single CPU. We're going to use a red building block to represent RAM or random access memory we're going to use a yellow building block to recommend a disk or a storage device and we're going to use let's go back we're going to use a blue building block to represent a network or a network device so what all we're really doing is abstracting the concepts of CPU RAM disk and network or compute storage and network into simple colors so we can build some simple models to explain how we used to do things and how we do them now so let's assume we work for a company that wants to replace our physical hardware we've got six current servers and we want to replace them with six servers of roughly equivalent specifications so six old servers to replace with six new ones so it sounds simple enough server number one our graphical representation shows we've got one green block so it's got one CPU one socket and one CPU uh, one giga RAM one terabytes worth of disk and one network card so pretty simple server number one server number two that we're going to replace is slightly different still got one CPU but now this one's got two giga RAM denoted by the two red blocks it's got two terabytes of disk not denoted by the two uh, yellow blocks and it's got one network card denoted by the one blue block so server number two slightly different it's just got a little bit more RAM a little bit more disk server number three that we're going to replace again slightly different again two CPUs, three giga RAM, three terabytes of disk, two network cards. Server four, slightly different again. Two CPUs, four giga RAM. The dark orange block is a RAID controller, so we've got a RAID controller and four drives now, and then four network cards. Um, we'll talk about RAID controllers in another video, but it's just a device that helps combine hard drives together or solid state drives together to make a more reliable or more highly performing drive. Server number five, this one's got four CPUs, six gig of RAM. This one's got two RAID controllers and four drives and two network interface cards. Server number six, an even bigger beast, four sockets, six gig of RAM, one RAID controller with five drives and six network cards. So we've got an upgrade nightmare here now because we've got six different physical servers. They've all been sized differently for different applications. So if I'm going to replace these six servers, I'm going to need six servers plus some for disaster recovery. So if I want to do disaster recovery, I'm going to need an identical server for each of the servers I'm buying. So I'm going to need 12 servers in total, six different types and two of each type. So twice the hardware needed for DR or fault tolerance or resiliency. So I now need to buy 12 servers in six different variations. So our six simple servers now become a little bit of a headache for us. And 
what about the operating system and apps? So even if I buy these six um, servers in pairs, you know, making 12 in total, I've got to reinstall the operating system on top of them to do the upgrade. I've got to reinstall the apps. And do I actually have all the media and backups for the data that corresponds with them? This seems like a, a, a quite a big job. So how could I do this differently? So I could I could use virtualization. So what we could do this time is we could instead of buying individual machines like we've seen before, we could buy a slightly more uh, beefier machine with lots and lots of compute storage and network, and I can install something called a hypervisor on top. So if I buy this bigger server, I can convert all the physical CPUs into virtual CPUs. I can take all of the physical RAM and turn it into virtual RAM. I can take all the physical disk and turn it into virtual disks or virtual data stores. And I can take all the physical network cards and turn them into virtual network cards. Now what this does is allow me to abstract physical hardware and pool it so I can run multiple virtual machines on top of less hardware. So just to illustrate that again, we're taking physical CPUs, central processing units, and turn them into virtual CPUs. We're taking physical memory, turn it into virtual memory. We're taking physical storage and turn it into virtual storage. And we're taking physical networking and network cards and turn it into virtual networking and network cards. So I have all the physical hardware at the bottom. This is my collection of servers. And the examples I'm going to give you are going to buy three beefy servers instead of 12 individual servers. I stick a clever piece of software on top called a hypervisor and that converts the physical hardware at the top to represent it back out as virtual hardware at the top. So why do I want this virtual hardware? Well if I've got a big pool of virtual hardware I can build lots and lots of virtual machines on top of it. So each virtual machine contains an operating system and applications. So what I can now do is I can pool all the physical resources together pool it and abstract it into standard so standardized virtual hardware and run multiple operating systems and applications on top and get much more efficiency and much more flexibility than buying individual servers so virtual hardware we cover this in other other videos so typically if I was going to use virtualization I'd build a cluster and I would start with three servers like we have there. So three, you can see there's lots of CPUs and RAM and storage and networking and I've joined them together. That bar across the top is meant to mean that they're all in the same cluster. So I, I buy three really powerful servers. I install a hypervisor on them, something like vSphere ESXi and I group them together in a cluster. The next thing I do is join a traditional storage array and in this picture it's the big yellow thing at the bottom. Most storage arrays are actually Intel x86 servers just with a, a clever piece of software on top that, that takes physical disks and turns them into a storage array. But essentially it's the same kind of hardware underneath. It's just got a different front or a different bezel and more hard drives connected but it's, it's, an, it's another Intel server with a storage network or a storage fabric connecting the two together. So I add some shared storage that's accessible by all three hypervisors. Um, as I said, this traditional storage array is just another x86 server with lots of disks and a, and a custom operating system. Um, if you were doing this now, it would typically be a hyper-converged infrastructure, something like vSAM, but this is how early clusters were built. So once I've got this cluster with shared storage at the bottom, those little white bricks on the top are the virtual machines. So I'm now running my six virtual machines on three pieces of physical hardware using a shared storage or the big yellow thing at the bottom uh, to create a cluster. So I've got um, a big pool of compute and a big pool of storage all working together as a cluster. So now the virtual machines can be run on the, the cluster. As I said, the six white bricks on top are meant to represent virtual machines. And the configuration files and data for each VM is on the shared storage, the yellow thing at the bottom, which means the data and the configuration is accessible by all three VMware hosts. Now this shared storage allows us to use features such as vMotion and high availability. So just to explain in simplistic terms, if I lose one of the three servers at the top, our power supply blows up or fails or I have an outage, because the virtual machines are stored on the shared storage, another virtual machine can just, um, sorry, another host, another 
any of the two remaining out of the three virtualization servers can just take that configuration files and data and start up the new virtual machine again on a different host and very quickly return that to service even though a physical server has failed. So again vMotion and high availability there are things we'll talk about in other sessions. But if I was to do this again modern day I wouldn't use a separate shared storage array I would just put more storage in the servers that we're running the hypervisor on to begin with. So I've still got some big beefy servers with lots of compute storage and networking but the storage, the yellow bit, has been massively increased. So I now have proportionally more storage in each server than I had before and I don't need a separate storage array because a clever piece of software running on the on the, on the vSphere host or the hypervisor host piece of software called vSAM that's now going to turn all of the shared store all of the individual storage in those servers into one piece of shared storage a little bit like the shared array we had before but everything is now self-contained in the host themselves so as I said we buy some powerful hosts lots of CPU RAM and network and lots of internal storage um, vSphere ASXi comes with a technology called uh, vSAN and vSAN can, ta can take any storage in each vSphere host and turn it into a shared pool of storage that looks much like a traditional storage array. And this is called Hyperconverged Infrastructure or HCI because vSAN is providing the shared storage element. Um, one of the most common ways of doing this is to use a VMware product called VMware Cloud Foundation and Cloud Foundation is a combination of vSphere ESXi, vSAN and NSX as a large building block or, or kind of solution for doing all of these things on a, on a common platform. So if I want to expand that three node or three server solution to a four node solution I can just add another node or another server and now I've got a four node vSAN or four node hyperconverged infrastructure um, and by adding another node we expand vSAN in terms of performance, capacity and availability just by adding the fourth node. It's good practice to make them roughly the same size but it's not a forced or hard requirement and just to illustrate that fact I could add a, mo a, a fifth server with much more storage it would still work it would be slightly less balanced but the clever software takes care of all of this for us so there's no reason that all the nodes have to be identical or the same size or the same amount of storage it's just easier if you do. So that's our fifth node added to the vSAN cluster and again the vSAN data store the single it looks like a single data store it just gets bigger in terms of performance capacity and availability as you add more storage and more servers and adding resources is non-disruptive so we can add the fourth or fifth node without any downtime as we just add nodes the performance and the capacity just gets bigger the availability gets higher so the next layer the hypervisor layer the hypervisor layer does a couple of things, uh, but I'm going to oversimplify it here. I'm going to say that the first thing the hypervisor layer does is pool and abstract the physical resources and represents them again as virtual resources. So I take physical compute storage and networking and I represent it back out as a virtual compute, virtual storage and virtual networking. I can also provide things like high availability and fault tolerance and support for policies that can be used to manage configuration settings and complaints. So I do the pooling and abstraction of all physical resources as one thing. I have high availability and fault tolerance as the next thing. And I have things like policies for configuration and compliance that work between different data centers and cloud providers without any need for manual configuration. And I'm going to use those three blocks on the right hand side just to squash it down as a sandwich just to illustrate the hypervisor. So if we want to build a platform, we can take those green, red, blue and yellow building blocks, the the compute as in CPU and RAM, the storage and the networking and we've got a virtualization platform. It makes it simpler if we just think about it as a single platform that comprises of all the hardware components underneath in a way that's been pooled and abstracted. So instead of showing you each server and all the different things inside it, I'm just going to show it as a sandwich or a big flat platform for running virtual machines on. So, as I said, although it's made up of individual hosts, it's easy to think of it as just a platform that's made up of all the compute, all the storage, and all the networking between all the hosts in the cluster. 
uh, and we pool it, aggregate it, and now we've got a platform for running virtual machines. In this example, I stick that layer on top, that hypervisor layer on top of the hardware, so the grey thing you see is the hypervisor sat on top of processors, memory, storage and networking. And now I can run different size virtual machines on top of this as a platform. As I said earlier, if you buy the hypervisor, plus the software defined storage, plus the software defined networking, in VMware terms that's called Cloud Foundation. That allows you just to think of your environment as a single platform that you just put virtual machines on top of without worrying too much about the hardware underneath. So as I said, we take vSphere, vSAN and NSX and we put them all together and we buy them as a product called Cloud Foundation. Um, and Cloud Foundation can be thought of as an operating system for running virtual machines across data centers and clouds. So the next thing we do once we've got a platform is we build a data center. And typically we'll build multiple different data centers in multiple different locations. So we have uh, three instances of Cloud Foundation here, the grey bits, with the actual compute storage and networking underneath, the uh, green, red, blue and yellow components underneath. Again, we've simplified it and just made it look like a single platform. And we have that same platform, Cloud Foundation, in three different locations or three different data centers indicated by the three different pictures. But it's the same software running at both sites, even though the hardware underneath might be slightly different. So once we've got all these clusters, uh, with all the necessarily uh, power and cooling, we have what we call a data center. But it's good practice to have two or three data centers, or anything more than one, in different geographical locations to make sure that extreme weather, power outages, floods or hurricanes or any other local events do not affect two or more data centers at the same time because of the same issue. So if we have a power outage at data center one or a flood in data center two or a hurricane or something else in data center three, we make it unlikely that we're going to lose all of our data at the same centers at the same time because of the same event or um, natural event. So we spread data centers out um, for redundancy and resiliency. So the next thing is, what if you don't want to have this many data centers or what if you want somebody else to run your data centers? So one of the options is VMware Cloud from a VMware service provider. So we take the same set of software, the hypervisor layer on top, plus they provide the CPUs, the memory, the storage and the networking and they squash it down into a, a, a flat platform that we call Cloud Foundation. It just becomes a place to run VMs and this is uh, bought as a service or leased as a service rather than paid for up front with CapEx. So this is just another way of running VMware virtual machines on a platform called Cloud Foundation but this time a provider or a cloud provider is, is providing it to you on a subscription based service rather than an initial capex. So it's the same technology found in VMware data centers can be found in over 4000 VMware cloud providers worldwide. So the same technology you have in your data center now is also offered out on a subscription basis by over 4000 VMware partners worldwide. Uh, and a good example of this is VMC on AWS or VMware Cloud on Amazon Web Services. So if you like using VMware technology, but you'd like to use Amazon Web Services, there is a service called VMC on AWS, which gives you a VMware environment on Amazon Web Services hardware. So you get all the same features and functionality of Cloud Foundation, but you, now you don't have to worry about managing buildings or power or cooling or servers or hypervisors. You literally have the VMware platform as a service. So the next thing to move on to is something called Hybrid Cloud, which is where we have a combination of on-premise VMware or vSphere and Cloud Foundation, as well as uh, Cloud Foundation provided by a cloud provider. Now you'll see in this, I have two data centers uh, on the left hand side and I have a cloud provider on the right hand side. We can see the colored blocks for the hardware on the left hand side because we own those, we've bought them, but we can't see the ones on the right hand side because they're the cloud providers, they manage them. But what we have got is a single platform running across the top which is the same in our two data centers as it is with the cloud provider but it's essentially it's just one place to run stuff. So Again, we've got a single platform spanned across two data centers and a cloud provider. 
So when we take this vSphere, vSAN and NSX, we get Cloud Foundation and you can think of Cloud Foundation as that a grey strip across the top where we run applications and services. So again Cloud Foundation is an operating system for running virtual machines across data centers and clouds. So what I can do with that is I can take all of my applications and services and spread them between my data centers and a cloud provider or multiple cloud providers and because it's the same platform using the same management console using the same configuration settings using the same policies it really doesn't matter where those servers are physically located it just looks like a single platform distributed across different locations so in the example above you can see the white bricks running on the same platform between two company data centers and a cloud provider but we've also got some smaller containers running on top of the VMs, the little the grey things. We'll come on to those next. So it's becoming more and more common to break large virtual machines or applications up into something called containers. And um, for a long while people have been talking about two technologies in particular, one called Docker, one called Kubernetes. Docker being the technology that allows you to break applications into smaller parts. Kubernetes, the thing that manages multiple Docker instances or multiple Docker containers, and these are all used in something we call um, containers and cloud native applications. So you can think of VMs as being the traditional way that we do stuff, and containers or cloud native applications being the new way that people are going to start building stuff. The reason I'm showing the, them here is that VMware have technologies that mean you can run virtual machines and containers on the same platform rather than have an IT environment for virtual machines and an IT environment for containers and Kubernetes. We can run it from the same place. So again, VMware Cloud Foundation and VMware Cloud Providers can all run containers seamlessly alongside VMs using the same set of tools and a consistent set of infrastructure and a consistent set of operations. So when I then look at public cloud, what we'll see that there are other options for public cloud, not just the VMware partners, but because the platform is slightly different, you'll find that the virtual machines and containers you can run on a VMware Cloud Foundation platform just will not run on a public cloud. The pieces are different shapes and sizes and do not fit. So you can recreate your virtual machines and you can recreate your containers, but it's kind of a, a one or the other. They need to be written for a public cloud provider or for an on-premise data center and VMC on AWS or Cloud Foundation or the, the VMware consistent platform is the only solution or only viable solution for running the same virtual machines and the same containers with the ability to move them backwards and forwards between data centers or between cloud providers without having to reconfigure or rewrite them. So as it says here, most public clouds are great for buying large chunks of CPU, RAM and storage and creating brand new applications, you know, cloud native applications or CNA, but they're not very good for running existing applications or legacy applications. And in simple terms, it's because there isn't an easy way of doing high availability and fault tolerance in the public cloud without rewriting your applications. That's something that the VMware hypervisor can do on premise and in cloud. So old applications or legacy applications don't need to be rewritten for a VMware platform, even if that VMware platform is running inside a cloud provider. So as it says here, public clouds do not support high availability of any application without modification, certainly in the same way that vSphere ESXi does, and most legacy applications would have to be rewritten or re-engineered to run in the public cloud with the same level of high availability and fault tolerance as they would have to do, as they would do natively now on vSphere ESXi. So um, that was an example of conferring, uh, comparing VMware Cloud with Public Cloud. The other things that I wanted to mention here was um, the three things that we said the hypervisor does because it's taken for granted that all hypervisors are the same but not the case in the Public Cloud. So on VMware Cloud or something like VM, VM, um, VMC on AWS we obviously have pooling and abstraction of physical resources which most of the public clouds will do as well because they've all got a hypervisor. Um, native high ability and fault tolerance is not always available. You must run and synchronize multiple copies at once or rewrite your application to get high availability and fault tolerance. Uh, 
Global policies for configuration and compliance. On a VMware platform, you can move things from one data center to another, and all your policies around storage, networking, security, firewall rules, and compliance follow the VM round. If you were to do that with a cloud provider, there are no global policies. If you move it from one place to another, you need to delete the policy from where it was and create a new one on where it's moved to. So again, it probably seems like a bit of an oversimplification, but everybody assumes that the hypervisor you use on-premise does exactly the same stuff as one in the cloud. There is even some thought that the cloud is even more reliable than on-premise, um, just because it's newer and it must be. But actually, the cloud can be super reliable but only if your applications are specifically written or rewritten to work in the public cloud so that's the end of my oversimplified version of um, virtualization clouds containers and public cloud and hybrid cloud again I must just point out this presentation although it had several images of various brands of building blocks and VMware product, uh, products and services. This presentation is not approved, not endorsed, and not made in association or collaboration with VMware or LEGO AS. It's only provided for educational purposes, and furthermore, LEGO AS is not affiliated with VMware Inc., and the illustrations in this presentation should not be interpreted as an endorsement of VMware products or services.